extend a warm welcome as you join us this evening from our service here in the hall at the Free Church and Cross. We're going to commence by reading God's word together in the book of the prophet Habakkuk. And this is chapter 3. This is the final chapter of this book in pages of the Old Testament. Habakkuk chapter 3. And we'll begin at the beginning of this chapter. Let us hear the word of God. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, according to Shagayonoth. O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers? or your indignation against the sea, when you rode on the horses, on your chariot of salvation, you stripped the sheath from the bow, calling for many arrows. Selah. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and roared. The raging waves swept over. The deep gave forth its voice, It lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their place. At the light of your arrows as they sped, at the flash of your glittering spear. You marched the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors, who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. I hear my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. To the choir master with stringed instruments. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word in our hearing. Let's pray together. Gracious and most holy God. We approach you as the one who is the creator and sustainer of life. We come realizing that you are the one who breathed into the dust of the earth and the man became a living soul, fearfully and wonderfully made. We come, O Lord, to recognize who you are and who we are. We come to remember and reflect 
upon the great privilege and blessing that you had given to our first father, how he walked with you in the garden, in fellowship, in innocence, the great beauty of all that that communicates and the wonder of being able to be with you. And yet, as our first father sinned, we realize that we have all come short of your glory, that still there is something within us that constantly seeks to lay hold of the things that we ought not to do. How we realize how deep-rooted sin is, and how the battle with it is ongoing, that it is constant as we seek to put it to death day by day, and yet in the realization that it will take us to the grave. For the wages of sin is death. And yet we rejoice with the apostle who comforts us by reminding us even when these very words are recorded for us, because the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. We bless you that he came in the form of a servant in order to do what we were unable to do in his purity and holiness, that he was able to keep your holy law and to display it to us. For he himself is the word who was made flesh and who dwelt among us and his glory was beheld by your people. Help us to behold his glory and the wonder of who he is, the one who grants to us an access back to that fellowship and back to that state of being with you in a different garden to realize that paradise awaits your people where we will be washed and made clean and forever to be with our Lord. Help us to praise you and to honor you. Open our hearts and minds to receive your truth and your grace, to wonder at the reality of who you are and what you have done for us. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us as we come to your word together. We give thanks for being able to engage in this way we bless you, Lord, that you have not left us to ourselves. We need encouragement and strengthening. We recognize the trial is before us and around us and within us. Help us, Lord, to seek to know more of you and who you are. Help us to be a praying people on our knees before our Creator, seeking to love you and to embrace your will, and to give ourselves fully to your demands. You call us to obedience, an obedience that manifests itself in love, in love to you and love to one another. Help us, Lord, to show this love and to seek to build one another up. We pray too, Lord, in compassion and care and love for those who are lost, we pray that you would save many. Draw them by your grace, we pray. Take them to the cross. Help the lost to be, to be found. Help them to know the great realization of hope and forgiveness. Pray for those who are struggling in different ways. Remember those who are going through trials of the body. Pray for them, Lord. Pray for those who are set aside in hospitals and in homes. Pray for those who care for them. Pray for those whose battles are within the mind. We pray especially, Lord, as we come at a time of intensity of the trial of our current experience. We pray, Lord, even for those who are in our governments and who sit in the highest offices in our land. Pray for their advisors. We pray for the extreme burden that they are under. 
we pray that they would seek the Lord while he is to be found and call upon him while he is near. We pray that we would all do this. And we pray too, Lord, as the experience continues, that you would grant us relief and release from our burdens by resting in you and finding healing and hope. We pray that you would look upon us with your mercy and your compassion and your love, and that you would bless your church throughout the world. We're mindful, especially for those who are persecuted. We think, Lord, many of the nations in Asia and Africa, especially, especially, Lord, under the assaults of Islam and the oppression of governments and armies and those who fight and who seek to maim and to put to death. We pray for protection and care and the flourishing of your church in love. Pray that you would bless us, Lord, as we continue at a time, even with regards to the virus here and how it's affecting great parts of the world in India and in South America. And even, Lord, as we think of the raising of the alarm, even in our own nation in these days. Pray that you would bless us with wisdom and discernment. Help us to understand and see the things that are unseen and to know that you reign and that you are triumphant and victorious. Bless us then, we pray, and forgive us our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first item of praise is from Psalm 90 in the Scottish Psalter. Psalm 90. And the tune is Huddersfield, verses 2 to 7. Here ever thou hast formed the earth and all the world abroad, even now from everlasting art to everlasting God. Verse 4, because a thousand years appear no more before thy sight than yesterday, when it is past, or than a watch by night. Psalm 90, the tune Huddersfield, this is the Scottish Psalter rendering, verses 2 to 7, the praise of God.
Seeking the Lord's blessing, let's turn together for a few moments to the passage that we read in chapter 3 of the book of the prophet Habakkuk. And we'll turn together to verse 16. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 16. And really what the phrase that we have towards the end of verse 16. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble. Just to highlight too, and with regards to translations, and you may be mindful of the King James translation, and that says that I might rest in the day of trouble. And of course, both these are communicating to us the same thing, of quiet rest in the day of trouble. These words bring before us what is a reality and something that is plainly obvious to us. And that is something that the Bible doesn't hide from us and, of course, something that becomes unavoidable for us in our own experience day by day through our own lives and through our own personal circumstances. That life does have troubles. In fact, life is filled with different struggles and challenges that we face. And many of them are extremely difficult for us to bear. Many of them are hard, and sometimes they become increasingly hard. And yet, what we have too, with regards to these words, is a different element that comes together in the words of the prophet, but doesn't always come together in the life of people. But it ought to be something that that accompanies the life of faith. That not only are there days of trouble, but there is the ability for quiet rest within it. I will quietly wait for the day of trouble. For us, trouble is a struggle and a hardship, and it was too for the prophet. And it is in the life of faith, and the Bible speaks with regards to As we saw last week, we were considering together the renewal of our mind, the aspect of discernment and reason and logic and all of these different elements. But we weren't divorcing that in any sense or dividing it from the reality of the emotional experience of the person. And so the Christian, the believer, is somebody who knows these emotional experiences too. And trouble is one of the things that threatens often to overcome us. And when we think here of this sense of waiting quietly or resting, when we think of that in terms of the language of peace and calm and stillness, we realize here how there is this great contrast and this great tension between these two things. And for us, it may be easy in many ways to speak on trouble and hardship and difficulties, maybe even to bring them from different parts of Scripture and to try in one way or another speak on them. But it's a far harder thing to go through trouble and to face difficulty, whatever difficulty you may have in your own life. And sometimes we confess that our faith struggles. And it struggles especially when we find it hard to understand what is going on. That this itself becomes a great challenge. That it's not just going through hardship, it's actually trying to figure out what is going on with ourselves or maybe with the world around us. Maybe when we're struggling to discern, struggling to being able to think things through. And when all the world is in trouble too. And our providence challenging and difficult and maybe even hurtful. And yet, as I've already touched on, this is not something new in Scripture. Even the Apostle Paul himself speaks of the challenges that he faces both within himself and outside himself. And to understand that the believer has all of these different struggles, and so too does the prophet here in these three short chapters. And as he tries to wrestle with the whole reality of his troubles and everything that's going on, 
in these chapters, he does many different things. I want us to especially consider what we have here in chapter 3 and what we have here in the words of our text, but really in the whole of chapter 3, but also to highlight what's gone before as well. And to see as the prophet here speaks of waiting quietly in the day of trouble, that first of all we see that he asks questions. And he does this from the emotional experience of faith, of following the Lord, of deciding to know what's going on, deciding to be able to comprehend what God is doing in the midst of the challenges and struggles that he is facing. The prophet here brings to us what is in some respects a rather unusual and unique experience. The closest parallel really is the book of Job, where Job asks God, why does the righteous suffer? And here, Habakkuk asks, why aren't the wicked punished? Uh, and now we have these parallels in different Psalms especially, but what is unique for us to highlight here is the whole, the whole movement of this book. This man is a prophet. We are reminded of this even in verse 1. Habakkuk the prophet. The prophet's task and his calling and what God has set him aside to do is to declare God's word to the people. And what we have here of a record of this prophet is not actually what he says to the people, but actually what he says to God. And that's what makes this rather unique. And what it brings to us is the anguish of the faith of this man. As he records in the first two chapters, especially, and then he touches on again here in this chapter, that all around him he sees wickedness, a world in rebellion and oppression against God and against truth. And not only that, but here as a prophet in Judah, probably con contemporary with, with Jeremiah to some extent anyway, that what he sees even in the land of promise and the land of covenant and in Jerusalem itself too, is the reality of moral and spiritual declension. That's what he sees in the society around him and the world around him. And what he recognizes as God has spoken to him is the foreboding coming in this dark cloud from the east, that there is a threat coming upon the people. A crisis looms large on the scene of this book. In chapters 1 and 2, what we have there is the prophet bringing his complaints to God, God speaking as well. And then in chapter 3, we have the conclusion of this book. And what we have is a prayer, a prayer that's actually set, as you see at the end of this chapter, it's said to be able to be sung. It's a prayer that he brings himself, but he wants others to join with him, to take this prayer and to sing it to God, and to have this as a collective prayer of the people. He prays, as we see here in verse 2, in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years. He speaks of being in the very middle of a particular moment in history a significant moment, and he is right in the middle of days, months, and years. And he understands what is going on in that regard, that there is something of such great significance, but he is struggling to comprehend what it is. But he knows that the days he is living in are difficult days. They are hard days. In the midst of the years, revive it. He knows that revival is necessary. He knows that a significant God-given change is required to make things better. He wants things to be better. He wants God to come in revival. I've heard the report of you and your work. I fear you, Lord. In the midst of the years, revive it. Revive your cause. Revive your church. Revive your people. And what he is here recording 
is how the people of God have become so small and so insignificant and so afraid and confused. And he's grieved. He's grieved within himself because of everything he sees. He sees what's happened in the church, in the temple, in the people of God, in the worship. He sees what's going on in the compromise and the pollution and the corruption of the holy things. And he knows the enemy is coming. He knows the empire of Babylon is rising. And it's overshadowing Judah and Jerusalem. And they're coming. They're coming to march. They're coming to defeat. And the prophet is grieved. And he understands and knows. In verse 2. That God comes in wrath. And he's asking God. In your wrath. Will you remember mercy? He knows that God has every right to be angry. He knows that everything that is going on is grieving God in his holiness. What he himself surveys in the land and the society and the world in which he lives in, in the midst of the years and everything that has come to its culmination in this moment. In the covenant land, in the covenant people, in the temple, in the worship. All of this corruption. He understands and knows. And he fears. For he knows the day of trouble is near. That crisis is approaching. That there is anguish and pain. And he's asking all of these questions throughout these chapters. He's asking, when is God going to punish Babylon? When is God going to punish wrongdoers? When is God going to punish these people who have done wrong? When is God going to deal with our backsliding? When is God going to come with his mercy? When is crisis going to be averted? When will there be revival? This is what he longs for. A recovery and reformation of holy things and of holy people. And he makes his appeal to God. He's got nowhere else to go. He can't speak to anyone else. The cause is at such a low ebb. And he struggles. As he gives his voice to truth. And the truth of the situation and the reality that is going on. And that trouble is here. And that he lacks. Comprehension. Of what's really going on. He asks questions. He secondly. Is able to express his fear. I've heard the report of you. And your work. We speak of him as a prophet. In many respects, that's related to his calling. And God has called him to be a covenant spokesman, to speak to the people, to declare to them God's word. But at the heart of that reality is that here is a man who knows God, who walks with God. Here is a believer who knows the character of God, who knows who God is. And prior to this, in the first two chapters, he closes the second chapter with a sense of this comfort. In chapter 2, verse 20, the Lord is in this holy temple. In all that he's expressed before this, with regards to all the confusion, all the difficulty, the, the wickedness being unrestrained and triumphing everywhere, He's come to this conclusion in his mind. Yes, but God reigns. God's in his temple. God is sovereign. And he's able now to start putting these pieces together. 
There is the corruption of the land, the pollution of the worship, the, the inconsistency and hypocrisy of the people of God, the immorality in the land, the spiritual and moral declension in society, and this oppressing power about to come and consume them. And all of these things pulling him from one way to another and begging questions out of his mouth and out of his mind. Until this point where he comes to realize what real fear is and who it is to be truly feared. I've heard the report of you and your work. I fear. I fear. He fears God. He knows God is just. He knows God is holy. And he knows God is going to come to execute the work of justice. I fear. And he knows. The people are backslidden. And God is going to deal with that. That's why Babylon has come. That's why the day of trouble is fast, fast approaching him. This is quite a frightening scenario when you think about it and you take a step back. Here is God's people. They've been promised land. They've left Egypt. They traveled through the wilderness. And finally they cross the Jordan and they enter in. They go and they possess the land. And the land, of course, is theirs by covenant promise from God. And then they establish themselves. And the monarchy is established, a Davidic monarchy. And then, of course, the kingdoms are divided. And we see there the sense now of how they are so backslidden. And what's coming to them as chastisement from the Lord is that they are about to be consumed by Babylon. Babylon is coming for them. And they cannot stop this. How does the contemporary church, the church of our day, deal with this? When we're overcome. You know, in the book of Revelation, this language of Babylon is employed once again. And it's used to speak of the anti-God society and the anti-God world. And all that is different elements of that. And you see there the picture at the last days, so how this becomes in the ascendancy as controlling and powerful and threatening. And we find ourselves in this kind of scenario where the church feels so small and so insignificant, where the anti-God world is in the ascendancy and has that power and is so threatening. And we ask ourselves, how do we live in this? How do we live in the present time? How do we live in the day of our trouble? And the picture, of course, for us in Babylon in the Old Testament is to live like Daniel and his friends. That even though we may be there with the anti-God world around us, so threatening and so powerful and so in the ascendancy, that we would remain faithful to God. That we would wait quietly in the day of trouble. And for the day of trouble. That's how we live. We live like Daniel and his friends. When we feel threatened. When we feel overwhelmed. When we feel there's trouble all around us. How do we live? How do we respond? The prophet says in verse 3. God came from Teman. And he continues. The, the picture really follows on from the end of chapter 2. There is God in his holy temple, and then God's coming down. God's coming. The powerful picture of the reality of who God is. His splendor covered the heavens. The earth full of his praise. The prophet brings before us in his prayer and in his song the majesty and sovereignty and the reality of who God is. His brightness, it's illuminating. It's like light, rays flashing from his hands, veiling his power. The great reality of who God is in his splendor and in his majesty portrayed to us by the prophet. Remember who God is. 
I've heard the report of you and your work, O Lord, and I fear. This is the one to fear, not Babylon. This is the one whom we stand before, and he is coming down in the splendor of his majesty from heaven. In this illumination, in verse 5, before him pestilence, plague at his heels. The reality of who God is and what he does. Taking them back to Egypt. How he manifests his power in that way. He stood and measured the earth, verse 6. This is who our God is. He looked and he shook the nations. All the peoples are shaking and trembling, even the eternal mountains and the hills, because his ways are everlasting ways. This is who he is, the reality of the almighty God. All the nations are trembling at the God from whom before goes pestilence and behind him is plagues. In the reality that he has come and he is calling the world to fear. Verse 8. Was your wrath against the rivers? Your anger against the rivers? Your indignation against the sea? When you rode on the horses, your chariots of salvation? And he's speaking here when he's splitting the earth of the rivers. He's speaking creation. He's speaking of Noah. He's speaking especially of crossing the Red Sea. This is the God of salvation. This is what he does. This is who he is. In verse 10, he gave his voice, lifted his hands on high. The sun and moon stood still. And he's reminded us, of course, of of the battle with Joshua. The light of your arrows as they sped at the flight of your glittering spear. You marched the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. This is who is coming. This is who God is. Prophet thinks of this. And he says in verse 12, You marched the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went for the salvation of your people, the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked. And so on. And what he is speaking of is that day of trouble that's coming for Babylon. The prophet will wait for that day. In the midst of his years, in the day of trouble, he'll quietly wait. He knows who's coming. He knows him. He knows he is a holy God. He knows he is a just God. He knows that he comes with wrath. He knows he comes. He is coming. He is coming. And his response is verse 16. My body trembles. My lips quiver. My bones are like they're rotten. My legs tremble. And he trembles at the awesomeness of who God is. In the reality of all that has been recorded for us. And the prophet trembles because there is nowhere to hide. The world trembles in the great reality of the one who is to come. And then the third element is his response. Because the response is what is recorded for us. In the words of our text, I will quietly wait for the day of trouble. He's waiting for the day. The day that comes, the day that is unavoidable, the day that cannot be bypassed, that we cannot rebel against the appointment of God. It's coming. It's real. For Judah and Jerusalem, there was a day of threatening foreboding from Babylon, the dark cloud coming from the east. The marching of the army and the reality of the captivity and the chastisement of God. But I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. It's the oppressor of God's people. 
and for the profit he finds for himself a quiet place. He finds in his soul somewhere to contemplate and meditate that the God who reigns is going to come as the divine warrior, as the one who comes. And the prophet is able to have confidence because in wrath he will remember mercy. In the day of trouble, we can have confidence and hope that our faith is to be informed. It's to be patient. It's to be committed to the will of God. We are called to be like Daniel, to have that kind of faith that waits. And all the faithful of the captivity waiting upon the Lord quietly in the midst of their captivity and oppression. They wait on the Lord for the day of trouble. And so the prophet has composed his prayer into a song. He has set it in its order. And he calls us to be part of that congregation that sings this prayer with confidence. Sings this prayer in the midst of everything that confronts and threatens our minds. That we would be at peace. That we would know God's ways better. That we would not lean to our own understanding, but that we would submit ourselves humbly under the mighty hand of God and wait quietly. When we think that things are difficult, when we feel small and threatened, when we feel overcome, when we look at the church and we wonder what will be, where do we go from here? What happens now? And we cry to God, will you revive your work in the midst of the years? Will you in wrath remember mercy? Will you do this? Will you build your church from its small and fragmented position? From being so insignificant in the midst of this Babylon of our world and our society. Revival comes God's way. Not our way. What we're called to is obedience and faith. To find that place of rest. That place of trust. That place of confidence of the awesome reality of who God is. And he even speaks in verse 17 especially of a day of personal devastation crisis where there is personal disaster and economic disaster. All of these things that are so important. People want to feel safe. People want to be well off. People want to have plenty. And he says in verse 17, if the fruit tree isn't going to blossom, no fruit on the vines, no olives, no food in the field, no flocks, no herds, none of these things. When I am in scarcity and poverty, when I have nothing, I have everything because you are my everything. God is everything. If God is with us, our cup is overflowing. We have joy in verse 18. I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll take joy in the God of my salvation. Even though all of these things come, the Lord's my strength. And he contrasts verse 19 with what he said in verse 16 about his bones and his legs. Now he says, my feet are like deer's. He makes me tread on the high places. Look at what this God does for me. He is my everything. He is more than anything else. He is my comfort, my joy, my satisfaction. What Matthew Henry says in regards to verse 17 is, When all is gone, God is not gone. God is not gone. 
What a comfort for the believer. When everything we have in this world will we'll lose our grasp from. But we'll have everything. We'll have him. To know him. The awesome and almighty God. We walk in a day of trouble with confidence. Because he reigns. We quietly wait upon the Lord our God. The prophet here isn't dismissing in any sense the reality of the pain and the anguish and the fear and the terror and the trouble. These days are real. These days are personal. These days are painful. But what he says is that he is able here to affirm the reality of the awesome majesty and sovereignty of God. And to say that God has a plan. God has a purpose. And God is at work. And when he comes, he comes in his judgment. And in his wrath, he will remember mercy. Isn't this all we have? We have his mercy. And we quietly wait. We quietly wait in him. We have nothing else. Because to have him is to have everything. Amen. May the Lord bless our thoughts together. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we bless and praise you for your great and wonderful truth and the great reality of who you are. May our souls comprehend your majesty and your sovereignty and the reality of your mercy. May you revive your work May you remember your cause. May you remember mercy in your wrath. May you bless and pity us and shine upon us with your face. Help us to be those who have souls at rest in you and at rest in your will, waiting upon you with that childlike faith that trusts believes. Forgive us our sins and go before us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll close with Psalm 91, as we have it in the Scottish Psalter, Psalm 91, verses 1 to 4. He that doth in the secret place of the Most High reside, under the shade of him that as the Almighty shall abide. I of the Lord my God will say, He is my refuge still, He is my fortress and my God, and in Him trust I will. Assuredly, He shall thee save and give deliverance from subtle fowl or snare and from noisome pestilence. His feather shall thee hide, thy trust under His wings shall be, His faithfulness shall be a shield and buckler unto thee. Psalm 91 to close the tune St. Stephen. Amen.